277 new podcast subscribers. That is how many we need this week alone, just this week, to reach 10,000 subscribers by the end of 2011. If we do meet 10,000, well, we can go on beyond 2011 and very far into the future, giving you all kinds of continued cultural conversation of the depth you demand. But if we don't, well, who knows? Might have to put this thing out to pasture. There are ways you can help, though. Find out by subscribing to the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Go to ColinMarshallRadio.com. That's ColinMarshallRadio.com. Click the Marketplace of Ideas logo, and on that front page, you'll find easy, easy details on how to subscribe to the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list and find out how you, too, can help the show survive past the end of this year and on to many, many more years beyond to get 10,000 subscribers, in short, by the end of 2011. Thanks. So anybody who's read your essays on photography is going to be familiar with the form of the essays that begin this new book, that there is a, a, a photo, and then from that photo you jump off into an essay. But a little bit later in the book, you know, we, when we don't expect it, there's another photo and an essay you jump into from there. It's a photo of a, a 28-year-old man on a roof in Brixton standing by his homemade bong, seeming to have a good time. What can you tell us about this man? Well, that, <clears throat> yeah, the, 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 I mean, it's one of those great Avedon pictures, uh, lines rather. He says, you know, you can say you don't like this particular photograph of yourself, but you can't say it's not you. So I would have to say, yeah, it, it very obviously is me, <laughs> in spite of all the changes that uh, have gone on. I mean, the physique remains the same. Those kind of, I think I talk about the gnarled root of my knee, and, you know, the, the skinny legs are very, uh, very obviously mine. And, yeah, it's funny. I mean, that's a, a picture of me and a group of friends on the roof, 1986, I think, something like that. And it's just that particular moment, really, the end of a particular moment when people are out of university and not quite being sure exactly uh, what they're going to do. And as is always the case, one ends up looking back on that period um, rather, rather sort of nostalgically and, and fondly. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, so. That's that's certainly that's certainly me with that with that homemade bong. Yeah. KCSB in Santa Barbara and Colin Marshall Radio. I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm speaking to the man in the photo, Jeff Dyer, author of the new volume, otherwise known as The Human Condition, selected essays and reviews, but also the author of many books on many subjects, including The Ongoing Moment on Photography, But Beautiful, about jazz, um, writing about, writing about, trying to write about D.H. Lawrence in uh, Out of Sheer Rage, novels like Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi, novels like Paris Trance and, and The Search, and there, there's many books and we'll mention probably all of them in the course of this but i want to know you know where in this where in the writing career this man in the photo is you've written your book on on john berger correct you've written ways of telling yeah that's right uh, i'd written my unbelievably boring little book on uh, now you keep you keep getting more and more down on that every time i mention <laughs> is, it, is your opinion lowering with time uh it's certainly not going uh, not going up with time i mean you know one of the things you most want as a writer is for your books to remain in print uh, that one uh, is deservedly out of print. Uh, the thing about it is that was important for me, though, is that um, it was such a sub-academic kind of book, and I think it got something out of my system, really, that I never had a, a... You know, I really... At the end of it, I thought, God, this was quite a lot of work, because writing a book is a, a lot of work. But I felt, you know, this is meant to be in praise of John Berger and the method I've adopted, subjecting him to this straightforward tried and tested academic processing not only doesn't do justice to what he's achieved it's a tacit sort of insult to him really <laughs> um so um yeah I, I i certainly you know i mean i goodness knows i mean people do go on writing such books but i, I knew i would never do another thing like like that and almost to the extent that i when i you know when i prepare these also by jeff dyer pages for books i'm I'm kind of tempted to cut it out, but then I think, well, it's, you know, I, you know, I, I did write it. 
but the, the stories are the essays in this book, in the new book, that talk about your life leading up to the moment where you're on that roof and, and your life around the time on the roof in Brixton. Nothing about the Jeff Dyer you described there says this is a man who has the gleam of academia in his eye. It seems like you, you didn't... seems like even then you thought, well, I've got to stay away from any further education, but yet you wrote what you call... And tell me, sub-academic means what? Um, yeah, it probably... It means something like... Um, uh, I mean... It, well, yeah, what does it mean? I think it means something that was... Uh, was a kind of surrogate PhD, but which probably didn't have sufficient rigour to have qualified as a, a PhD. And, I mean, you're right in a way in that, um, you know, I left university after my, my BA and I had no desire to go on to do uh, any, any further um, uh, ac- academic study like that. And I certainly didn't want to be in a, in a, in a, in a university. Uh, and, I mean, I just had enough of it by then and it's funny I mean probably I think this is probably not uncommon twice a year I have these awful dreams where I'm doing exams uh, and it, I wake up I mean I don't wake up with the same relief that I get when I've, when I've dreamt that I've committed some sort of I've been caught doing some robbery and I'm going to be in jail for 20 years but it's probably the next stage of dread down from that who was John Berger to this this 28-year-old Jeff Dyer on the roof? I mean, what, what was he to you then? Oh, yeah, so um, I did English at university, and I left university with that incredibly provincial belief that I'd read everything. Uh, but that's, I only had that idea because um, my idea of what constituted literature was limited, really, to novels and, and poetry. And then when I left university, I started, you know, reading a bit more widely, and Um, I thought I'd like to read about painting and stuff like that. And I think somebody told me that there was a great explanation by this guy, John Berger, about how perspective came about. So I read, like everybody else, that book, Ways of Seeing, and then some other books by him. And there were two things. First of all, he made paintings which seemed really quite boring to me. Uh, You know, boring old oil paintings made them seem interesting. Uh, But also I began to realise that he was a writer who wasn't just defined by his subjects. Uh, the books weren't interesting just because of what they were about. He was, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a proper writer in his own right, but in a form, in a, in a kind of configuration that I hadn't uh, realised existed. And then about the same time, I was coming across, you know, uh, European versions of the same. So Roland Barthes, all these people, uh, writers who were, um, they were doing something which was creative. And at the same time, it was a form of commentary, uh, a form of imaginative writing that was that was also a form of criticism. And you know, I, this was I was really ready f- for that because at university there'd been such a strict division, it seemed, between criticism and the stuff that the critics were writing about, novels and poetry. And coming up, I want to get a sense of if you thought the lines between the forms, you know, the, the walls dividing these forms, artificial though they may be, were, were you saying to yourself, I've got to tear these down, or was it more like, well, I don't care that those are there? Um, it was, I mean, there's, I guess it was this, really. What I was conscious of was that uh, at university we would spend the vacations reading the novels, which were, which were fun, you know, you'd spend your time reading Dickens, all this sort of stuff, and then in term time you would be reading the criticism and this was very very this was kind of quite boring criticism much of it you know this wasn't these weren't were often not the great works of literary criticism it was just sort of standard stuff and there seemed such a it seemed so dis, sort of disappointing really like is this all, all there was um and um yes yeah, so i was conscious not so much as a, a, a not so much of a wall as just a, the, the vastness of the gap between the one thing which was pleasurable and the other thing which was incredibly boring. <laughs> and the way that actually the whole study of literature actually became really this uh, about criticism, really. And it brings me to th- this idea, thinking about Berger, thinking about you know your books or the books of writers associated with you, like the books of Pico Iyer or of uh, Elaine de Baton, uh, who, who blurbs this new book. These are writers who are 
I guess I guess enjoyed regardless of subject or their subject independent writers. I mean, would that does that work as a description of writers that you like, writers that inspire you? Are they all subject independent? Yeah, I mean that's a really important thing for for me. I think in that um, there are um, certain books that you go to non-fiction wise. Still, the in a way, still um, non-fiction tends to be something that people go to for the content. So let's say <clears throat> let's say a, a book like um, Stalingrad by Anthony Beaver. You know, why would you read that book? Because you want to you, you want to learn about Stalingrad. Yeah, presumably, yeah. Um, and but you know, then on the basis of that, you might realise, uh, oh, Anthony Beaver is a very good military historian. So you would uh, then go on to read him about the fall of Berlin, all this kind of stuff. But yeah, I'm very keen on this idea of um, you know the much more um, I don't know sort of auteur version of, of non-fiction, where yeah, you're reading it. For the author, really, irrespective of whether or not you have any interest in or knowledge of the subject, and that is the really, uh, you know, I, I, I think in a way the the great test of a of a writer is to be able to um, get a reader to in read a book and enjoy it in spite of their either indifference to or perhaps hostility to uh, to what the book what the book is about. And Burge is important in this regard as well because he really ab- abolished for me this. Um, it's sort of really important sort of red herring uh, typically when you read books there's people say oh the, you know, it's either an academic book written for fellow experts or it's um, a book written for the, you know, the average reader or the general reader whatever you want to call it and you know Berger completely smashes apart that distinction because the book on Picasso it's full of all sorts of Insights that somebody who knows Picasso, who's studied Picasso's work for years, would would be very interested to hear, because you know Berger is such an original mind. And at the same time, even if you know nothing of Picasso, uh, the power of Berger as a writer and the way that he tells the story of Picasso's life and development as an artist, uh, it would, it, you know, so it's appealing to what what are often considered to be these quite distinct constituencies and I've certainly I've certainly followed uh, along those lines I think Using this word auteur, you know, bringing that in from the world of cinema and thus I think inadvertently appealing to my own (laughs) brand of cinephilia you know, it made me think immediately of the other art forms you write about in this book and elsewhere I don't know if you bring it up here in this book but Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker, which you've had a lot of praise for in, in articles all around, you know, Tarkovsky, perhaps the ultimate auteur. Yeah. Is he an auteur in the same way as these these writing, these liter- these literary, these intellectual auteurs are? Is there an actual correspondence? Yeah, actually, well, this is quite interesting because it happens that I've just finished um, uh, <clears throat> I've just finished a book which will come out in February next year, which is an incredibly detailed kind of summary of of Stalker by Tarkovsky, which is a film that's always meant so much to me. Um, and, yeah, so, I mean, uh, yeah, so I really address what St- what Tarkovsky means to me in this book. But, I mean, you're absolutely right. He is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate auteur, you know. There's, um, uh, but really, I think, in a way, the filmmakers that I feel closer to, in terms of, or the filmmakers who are doing something equivalent to what I'm doing I think there'd be um, it would be the Herzog in the documentaries you know these very authored documentaries and there's a really famous old line by Goddard somewhere I can't remember from which phase of his career it was but he says something like you know I'm, I'm an essayist uh, you know it's just that my you know uh, my you know I do essays in the form of novels novels in the form of essays it's just that I do it on film <laughs> so those are the kind of um, uh, uh, people that I feel close to in terms of their, uh, you know, that that way of working. Even though I feel, in some ways, actively hostile to Goddard as a as a um, as, as a filmmaker. And in terms of film as film, you know, Tarkovsky. I just I love Tarkovsky, but I I don't see any real connection between what I'm doing and what uh, what was going on in you know in his uh, in his mission. We're sitting in the right place to discuss this, I think. You know, the last times I've come to L.A., I've come here for 
Godar retrospectives. I've come here for Herzog documentary retrospectives. <laughs> so, you know, we're in Los Angeles. We're here where the Festival of Books is going on, just to peel back the curtain for a moment. And, you know, these names you bring up, Godar, Herzog, uh, I guess I brought up Tchaikovsky, but the names in the book as well, you know, Thomas Bernard. Uh, there's, there's so many of these names that I think people might associate with, quote-unquote, high culture. Do you... I, uh, first of all, can I safely assume that's not a distinction you endorse, high and low? Uh, that's, um, um, it, I mean, my interests have tended to be in sort of, uh, it, in, you know, in inverted commas, high culture, I guess. And I'm not really, I mean, it's probably to do with age, really. I'm just not even, I don't even know what's going on in sort of pop music, all this kind of stuff. In fact, probably even calling it pop music shows how out of touch I am. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's, uh, th for me, there's not some categorical interest between sort of high and low. There is a distinction, though, between stuff I'm interested in and stuff I'm uh, indifferent to uh, and ignorant of. Um, it's interesting, though, what you say, because, yeah, I mean, I, I'm really not trying to sort of hustle my, my, my Tarkovsky book, but one of the things that stri Tarkovsky is written about in these incredibly reverential uh, ways, he's treated as this kind of, you know, Tolstoyevsky kind of, uh, kind of figure, and um, that kind of reverence is absolutely an anathema to me. <laughs> and so there's a, an epigraph in the book from uh, Camus, who I, you know, I really, it means an incredible, uh, you know, I've, just felt this incredible connection with and he says in one of those essays um, you know the best way to speak of something we love is to speak of it lightly mm. so if I mean my, my book on Tarkovsky which I say with 100% confidence is absolutely unlike anything ever written on Tarkovsky before is also screamingly funny and extremely <laughs> uh, disrespectful uh, but I think in a way that's actually the most appropriate register convey for, for conveying my my the profound effect that, that particularly the film Stalker has, has, uh, has had on me. Uh, to go back to another me name you mentioned, another name you mentioned, Thomas Bernhard. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's, um, you know, the blurbs on the English, the English editions always have a sort of quote from, you know, George. George, the English simply will not do Steiner, uh, <laughs> saying that it's, you know, Thomas Bernhard, the last in the great European tradition of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, um, God, what's his name? Oh, Herman Brock, all this kind of... That's the kind of tra trajectory. And that's true, of course, but at the same time, you know, uh, Bernhard is screamingly funny. Uh, you know, I have this nearly pathological aversion to the so-called comic novel, because yes. I find them so un uncomic for the most part. Bernhard is so unbelievably funny. Um, so... Uh, and I think it's quite interesting in a way that you can see Bernhard's influence creeping through into um, quite a lot of now really cool American writing. Uh, you know, it's, I think Sam Lipsight is a Bernhard fan, so is, so is John Haskell. So it's quite, you know, so, um, you know, uh, he, Bernhard is an incredibly serious writer and an incredibly funny one at the same time, and perhaps that's... Um, that's perhaps more important, that compatibility, to me, than this distinction between high and low culture. And the, for me, the sort of stylistic breakthrough that I made was in my the Lawrence book, Out of Sheer Age, where I found I was able to go from the discursive and the analytical to the sort of slapstick and the comic without any... Uh, with barely any kind of change of gear or certainly without any change of register. So it's not high and low, it's maybe light and heavy, is it better? <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, and it's all, you know, it's, it's, I suppose it's this thing like when you're with friends, you, it's the friends that you, you're happiest being with, you can, you can switch between being funny uh, and talking seriously without any, without even breaking stride, really. And I, you know, I, I really, I really like that. Uh, and also, I, I love the kind of comedy where, you know, people are not even sure it's... Uh, you know, it's that very, very dry, that dry humour where it, often there's a slight delay be before you actually realise that it, it's funny. So, uh, and, and, you know, God, there's a load of that in... There's a load of that in Tom... I love the, I love the delay in Thomas Bernhard where it takes a while. It's the same with Zabald, actually. You know, it took me ages to realise that Zabald, in his wan and melancholy way, was in many ways, a, a comic writer. 
you know, you're talking about Bernhard and Sebald and, and all them alongside some of the other subjects in your essays. You know, you move from guys like those to to talk about drugs and bodily functions, you know, shall we say, you know, fairly fairly effortlessly it would seem, maybe not always in the same essay, but certainly you put two essays alongside each other and you see that's quite a, shall we say, uh, juxtaposition. But, you know, I like that. Your, your fans like that. But it always gets brought up, well, it often gets brought up in writing about you. Do you ever worry that that, if it is a natural tendency, will start to be perceived as a shtick? Oh, uh, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know, in this... God, I don't know why I keep... I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to be out for another year, but I keep coming back to the Tarkovsky book. And, you know, there's... Um, you know, in the... I might as well fess it up now. You know, in the Tarkovsky book, I yet again quote a big chunk of Rilke. And I can see that's, you know, that, you know, here he is. Oh, here, you know, here it comes, the inevitable Rilke quote. And this is, uh, what can I do about that? I mean, these, you know, I guess it's just so much part of my formation and who I am. And, you know, in, in considering these matters, it's sort of inevitable that one comes back to Rilke. And I think maybe it's not unusual, really, for the, by the time you get to my age, that there are certain certain writers that you keep referring back to and this comes across in the, in the book of essays I think that there's this kind of mini personal canon which is so important uh, to me but yeah I totally take your point that I've got a um, yeah it's 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 um, the, the line between having a style and a, an authorial identity and having a shtick is a fine one and I'm very conscious of this because in the one of the essays in this book, I talk about DeLillo, the, that last novel of his, Point Omega, and talk about the way that, you know, there is, we all, we're all aware of this thing called self-parody, which all the great stylists to succumb to. And, you know, beyond self-parody, there's self-karaoke. <laughs> yes, I like that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, goodness knows. I, so, and it's, it's particularly, and I think I'm, it's particularly pertinent you ask this at the moment because... You know, people ask me, you know, who are the big influences on you? And I would, you know, I'd trot off the sort of names that you would expect. But to be absolutely honest, at this stage of my career, this sort of mid-career, you know, here I am, you know, 52, classic sort of mid-career type age, who's the biggest influence on my work at this point? To be absolutely honest with you, it's me. <laughs> um, and that is, you can see that, yeah, how you can see how that's setting oneself up for self-karaoke. But uh, I think probably that's, that's probably not unusual for people at, at, this, at this stage of, a, of a, creative, a, a creative life. I mean, do you look at your books and say, I, your, your old books and say, I like these, but in a sense I kind of want to cast them away and start from, start from zero again? Or what's the impulse? It depends. I mean, you see, this is the thing that if... If I'd been a straightforward novelist, then you might say, OK, you know, books, novels one and two were apprentice works. Number three, I really find my feet. Number, you know, and you go on, you can see it's, it's a kind of um, like some sort of climbing up a, a mountain. You can see there's an ascent, and of course, maybe then in late, then there's, a, then there's the descent, and of course, on the way, there's dips. But because my books have been so different, um, I feel it's, it's you know, it, it's not it's a it's a i mean to use that pompous phrase it's a body of work which which doesn't lend itself to that way of processing having said that i mean okay if we talk about the first novel the color of memory there are really lovely things in that i think oh there's a kind of lyricism that i really like but there are i mean it goes almost hand in hand with the lyrical impulse there are sort of excesses i think uh there's a bit in the jazz book which I was looking at to do a reading the other day, and I, there's a bit where Art Pepper, um, you know, there's a scene where he's um, he needs to rush to get some heroin somewhere, and he shoots up, and then I, I think there's a line I talk about the elixiric rush, and I think, oh my God, that is just a that is just such a terrible, inappropriate word, but such a sort of young person's word as well. So I wish that wasn't there. There's uh, all sorts of lines in. Uh, there's a bit. There's an essay in the in this book called Blues for Vincent, which I wrote in about 1990. Uh, and there's stuff there about the origins of the blues, which I find a bit, which I find a bit embarrassing. But um, that's, you know, it would be, it would be a sign that you hadn't made any progress at all if you if if uh, you know if you if you didn't regard your books differently now. 
to how you did when you when you wrote them. But I should say that there's there's been a loss as as well. It's not like um, I can look at those books now and say, oh yes, I wish that wasn't there and that wasn't there and blah blah blah. Because actually, I see now that in the later books that 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 lyrical kind of thing is, you know, that's I can see that dying out in a way. Uh, there's just a, in you know yeah it's I mean so it's. You know, there's a lot going on in the in the, the things that make one a writer and that define how your writing evolves over over time. And it would be great if your, um, you know, if that lyrical, that 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 sort of lyrical thing was able to coexist with the most severe kind of critical instinct as well. But it, it tends not it tends not to, I think. And when you lay these books out, you know, whatever in whatever ways you can't categorize all of them together, people still find their way to put you under the umbrella, a broad umbrella of cultural generalist. And you write an essay in here, or you have an essay in here about another very well-known cultural generalist, Susan Sontag. And she's complicated for me because, you know, I, if you look at the list of shows I've broadcast or things, things that even I've written, I guess I have to call myself a cultural generalist also. But, and so for any cultural generalist, it seems like Sontag is, that may be the goal. Like, well, if you get to her level, you've really made it. Then you're, you're a super cultural generalist. You know, you're, but at the same time, in the same proportion, to me it seems like she, she is, she's an icon of something one wants to achieve as a cultural generalist, but also... Um, in a sense, a cautionary example, because uh, I get moments when I don't know whether Susan Sontag knew everything or nothing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? This is heretical, I realize. Yeah, no, I think it's... I mean, I, you're right, Sontag is a really interesting case, but I, for me, it's in a slightly different way in that uh, I think those essays are so <clears throat> magisterial and all of the, all of this but i think for sontag it's this it's this um sort of insecurity that <clears throat> given her ability to to judge and process and comment on on uh, literature she she felt she had to do it you know had to produce uh, these novels herself and the irony is of course that all sorts of people who uh, have a fraction of um sontag's intelligence are actually much better fiction writers than her and I think this was a thing that she she wrestled with all, all the time, really. I mean, it seems to me that every you only have to read a a couple of pages of Sontag to see that she's really not a uh, you know. That is a, um, you know, at one stage late in her life, I think she caught, refers to herself as a storyteller, and I make this really crude <clears throat> crude joke in the essay about her. I say, you know, she couldn't tell a story to save her life. Um, and at her best, she realised that. So during the first sort of bout of cancer, you know, she didn't write some novel about somebody suffering from cancer. She wrote an essay about uh, the way that uh, illness has been presented as, um, you know, in, in literature. Uh, but then I think just almost through a kind of ambition, as much as uh, having a creative urge, there was this... She had to write these novels and just about find, found a way of harnessing her discursive tendencies to some sort of narrative locomotive but um you know really i think it's um you know it's as a it's as a critic that her main claim to being a a, a great writer will will always be will always be made if you've just tuned in this is the marketplace of ideas and i'm colin marshall my guest is jeff dyer intellectual gate crasher author of books on world war one on photography on jazz on dh lawrence on travel and many subjects besides his newest book is an essay collection entitled otherwise known as the human condition if you want to hear this show again after the broadcast is over, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com or search for the Marketplace of Ideas on iTunes. In either place, you'll get the complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive completely free. If you want to keep up on all things Marketplace of Ideas, new interviews, current interviews, related internet interestingness, sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Find the very simple instructions at ColinMarshallRadio.com as well. Now, back to the show, back to the conversation with Jeff Dyer for more cultural conversation of the depth you demand on the Marketplace of Ideas. So let me see if I can clarify this, this distinction, I suppose, between our views on Sontag. I, I look at her career and fear that, and fear looking like I too 
may form opinions on a few dozen Eastern European operas <laughs> and kind of dine out on that. And, you know, opinions that aren't really testable in, in a sense. And you don't know whether they're in good faith sometimes because they're about a relatively obscure things. You look at her and say, well, maybe be, be wary about be wary about moving into the form you were so good at analyzing because it doesn't necessarily translate yeah it doesn't necessarily translate i mean berger is perhaps a more successful example in that uh uh yeah i think berger's been a um you know a credible art critic he's written these amazing documentary books and some really really first rate books of books of fiction and um yeah, so it is. It is possible to do to do all of these things. But what I'm what I'm struck by is that the way that the to be a good novelist, you really um, you don't necessarily have to have all of the qualities that made Sontag a, a great essayist. And you know, there's a <clears throat> there's a. I mean, I'll just throw a couple of other lines into the mix here. You know, there's a, an essay by. Martin Amis on Gore Vidal, and he says something like, "You know, Gore Vidal is too clever to be a to be a really good novelist. Uh, you know, what he's good at is being an essayist. You can't be too clever for that." Okay, there's you know that's there's an element of truth in that. I think. I mean, you have to be really, really clever to be a novelist, but it's a different kind of intelligence. Is, is my point. And then there's that Aldous Huxley line, which I'm which I identify with absolutely, where he says something like. You know, I'm really just an essayist, sufficiently ingenious to get away with writing a very limited kind of, kind of fiction. <clears throat> and um, you know, I think that's uh, that could be that would. That I feel, yeah, that's. I mean, that's something that I, I, yeah, I think that defines what I'm up to quite, quite, quite well, actually. And later in this collection of essays in the new book, you have a. You have an essay about, not about, but it mentions how you had to learn to lie to be able to write fiction. And was, is that a part of this? How, you know, you can be clever, you can be smart, you can be a good writer, but if you're not, if you're not able to lie, you can't really do it. Yeah, well, I think we have to contextualize that. Uh, the way that I, the reason I, I say is that, that I, I mean, I'm really, abs- in my personal life, I'm hopeless at lying. And I think this is because of not having, any, not, not having any brothers or sisters. And I wasn't even aware of this until somebody said that, yeah, that if you have brothers and sisters, you, you sort of, you, you know, you, I don't know, I can't remember why now, but, uh, you know, anyway, so I don't have any brothers and sisters and I have this inability to lie. And then it came about when, <clears throat> when, I, when I was writing this first novel, The Colour of Memory, and I was really, it was a phase of my life when I was really wanting to have a sister. And then I had this... Uh, breakthrough, you know, which should have been so obvious to me all along that you know, if you want to have a sister, you just invent one. And then, uh, of course, in this book, I, I invent the ideal sister, you know, one that you're sexually attracted to. And of course, uh, people who have brothers and sisters say immediately, and that just shows what uh, you know how you really don't know what it's <laughs> what it's really like. Um, and then, actually, in the in the writing that I've done, you know, it's. I'm now actually very, very uh, able to uh, in, put things that didn't really happen in my non-fiction books and, you know, shift things around. I can do that, you know, really uh, almost instinctively now. But I should say this isn't a James... Do you pronounce it Frey or Fry? I believe Fry. Fry. This isn't a James Fry-like thing because the interest of my books is really not predicated on my having done a particular thing. You know, I'm really not claiming to have... Um, you know, I uh, got my hand stuck in a canyon and had to, you know, the interest is not, in my books, is not on them having been based on a true incident. And the, the changes I'm making are really, uh, they're just so insignificant and they're just aesthetic and artistic. Um, so, um, yeah, there's not, there's not an issue there. This the whole fiction, non-fiction thing, though, is... Is sort of important, I think, because people tend to think that the different, the distinction is one of, you know, did it happen or didn't it happen? Uh, how true to life is it? Whereas I think it's actually much more about, uh, first of all, about form, uh, the particular way in which you uh, arrange your experience, whether it's either imagined or, or actual. And even more important than that, I think it's about the expectations that readers bring to certain forms. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I th- uh, that. I think it's a, it's a, if you like a a, a a readerly problem rather than a writerly one. 
Now, you mentioned growing up as an only child, and it's, it's something that comes up a couple times in the essays in this book, and especially there's a concept, you know, I grew up as an only child myself, and certainly I'm sure many of the listeners to, to the show did, but you mentioned grow, if, if growing up as an only child taught you anything, it's that the world owed you a living. And I said, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess it does feel that way. And, you know, you mentioned there, there's things that I think listeners will that will resonate with listeners and certainly resonate with me. Growing up as an only child, you know, we really like our Tarkovsky films and our ECM records and we read our Thomas Bernhardt. Well, that's an only child thing, is it? I, I, well, I mean, I'm not saying they're all connected, but I'm saying people, if I have these same clusters of traits, I'm sure listeners do as well. There were everywhere, everywhere. But the thing is, these clusters of traits, I find, do not necessarily correlate with being, with being better able to relate to the rest of humanity. But in your essays, in your books, especially, you know, the book about travel, you seem to make friends pretty easily. I want to know what you think the difference might be. Okay, well, I guess, first of all, I mean, I really do, as I, I mean, I, I jokingly sort of interrupted, but I, I really, I, I don't think there's uh, any kind of uh, correlation between only childness and uh, a propensity for enjoying ECM or Tarkovsky yeah. or, or whatever. I mean, that just seems, that seems insane <laughs> <laughs> but yet all the you know I've met people with all these same I don't think they correlate but I think people who happen to have all these traits read your essays and think hey here's someone who has it more figured out than me oh I see um, yeah it's you know I mean okay so to go back to this uh, question of m making friends yeah uh, it's um, I think one of the qu qualities of being an only child or at least certainly something that that, that actually let's let's step back i think that i mean that partly as a way of folding your question into this comment i mean the wager always in essays or in writing generally is the and you know you can take it back as always to montaigne you know where you 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 want to arrive at a universal truth but you know that the chances of doing that are increased massively by your remaining faithful to your own uh, you know the vagaries of your own temperament and the contingencies of your own of your own experience and you know the more precisely you articulate the peculiarities of your circumstances and of your point of view the greater the chance paradoxically that they will be shared by others okay that's a that's a point so my my particular thing is um, yeah I love sort of meeting new people and being uh, making new friends and particularly at festivals and stuff and I realize what it, it's all I've always loved being part of a group just love being in a group and I reckon that's in my case I can trace that back so easily to being an only child whereby I'd, be, I'd enjoy being out playing with my friends because I grew up in an area where there were lots of kids and then always there'd be this moment when um, other kids would go back into their family where they'd be part of a different group with their brothers or sisters whereas I'd always be on my own I mean on my own with my incredibly loving parents but still it wasn't like being a, a group in the way that it is, I imagine, with with your brothers and sisters. You know, even if you're just squabbling and one of one of you is crying, it's still a sort of group experience. So anyway, uh, that's um, uh, yeah. I've just always yeah, just I've always uh, always enjoyed that. And then, in when you're, I think one of the great things now in this whole thing of sort of you know young people traveling in Southeast Asia, there's this great sort of roving nomadic uh, kind of. Um, a oh, group scene, which I know people are very scathing about. Often these kids on their on their gap year, gap years, but a it's a, a I think it's a lot of fun for them, and b it requires still even though it's a well established kind of thing, it requires a certain amount of initiative to you know navigate your way around the world on on a limited uh, on a limited budget like that. And this sense, I, I want to not let go of the Montana angle because number one. I think a week or two before this interview airs, audiences will have heard my interview with uh, a recent biographer of Montaigne. So there's oh, a... Is that Sarah Bakewell? That's Sarah Bakewell, yeah. indeed. Uh, the one whose Skype call was giving me trouble. But uh, the there's an important thing here because, you know, people, everybody seems to have fairly specific tastes. And often those tastes, those opinions get in the way of, of connecting with other people. You know what? In the interview with, with Bakewell, we talk about how Montaigne used honesty as a solution to dissolve the, the harshness of opinion and render it into something else that is no longer the wall of opinion, but something that makes, that makes him relatable 
to others. And, you know, you, you lay out some opinion, opinions in this book. Um, but how, how do you keep opinions from dividing you from the rest of the world, I guess, is, is a way to put it. I don't know if you ever thought about opinions as doing that. I mean, maybe you haven't, and that's an interesting thing in itself. I guess the, uh, it's, um, it's funny because in, in our house at home, uh, Rebecca, my wife, keeps saying, God, you've got all these rules for things. Uh, but they're not rules. They're just uh, extreme, pre- they're extreme preferences. And I guess in the kind of the hierarchy of things, I mean, you know, one has one's preferences, uh, which are not... They're not any kind of value judgment. So, you know... Uh, you know, in the realm of coffee, like, you know, you could say, well, you like your coffee one way, I like my way another. And there's not really, that's not to say that my taste is more, uh, you know, I'm a more discerning person than you. But you don't have to go much, you know, you don't have to go far beyond that bef- before your credentials become, come into play, really. So that if, if you say, if, you know, for example, once you start putting chocolate on your cappuccino, it seems to me you're... Your source that we're starting to move slightly out of the realm of just innocent personal preference, and I would say the then, ruin. yeah, I mean, it's a, you're you're clearly a less at that point you're you're obviously a less discerning cappuccino drinker than I am. <laughs> okay, so now we move into slightly more more exalted uh, territory. So yeah, the, and so the, you know, then we're you know you move from preference to opinion, uh, and then you know you start justifying those uh, opinions and those preferences and then of course you move into the realm of criticism and and judgment uh and well okay we're all we're all agreed about the difficult uh, difficulty of arriving at uh, objective judgments of uh, of um you know aesthetic things but uh you know so what what becomes at issue then is uh you know the kind of uh you know the, the the sort of the the way you make your case i get i guess and you're as a critic you're you're what's constantly on display and um constantly subject to to sort of appeal i guess is your own is your own capacity for 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 discernment and um what your what yeah you're your ability to justify putting yourself in this position of making these uh, claims of value on behalf of, of certain things. Is there a line, and this distinction only just occurred to me, but is there a relevant line here between being a strong enthusiast and being, I guess, what's called a geek nowadays? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good point, isn't it? Um, and also, I guess, you know, for me, I mean, I'm a great enthusiast, I really am, uh, but, I mean, to, to, to succumb to another of my tics of forever quoting Nietzsche, you know, uh, as he says so, so somewhere, you know, the great venerators, i.e. the great enthusiasts, are also the great despisers. And, you know, there's an inevitable flip side for one's enthusiasms, that one, uh, you know, one, uh, there's a great deal that one is not only not enthusiastic about, but, but to which one is actively hostile. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, uh, you see, this the whole sort of geek thing, it seems to me that's, I mean, I like, I like, uh, I like sort of geeks, really. I like people who are, who have their, you know, who have their area of obsession it seems to me weirdly that um that can my own kind of sort of self-description though is of not of being geeky so much as a, a much more much perhaps a much more english and more old-fashioned thing of being an amateur which goes back to these sort of victorian amateur sort of um i don't know what we'd call them not archaeologists you know fossil gatherers and just without any kind of <clears throat> without any special area of, of expertise um, and I suppose this is something I'm not really quite, I mean I wonder what the distinction is between being a geek and being an expert uh, because I'm aware that I'm drawn to sort of geeks and their, their sort of enthusiasm whereas I'm quite often hostile to the, uh, to the ghetto mentality of the expert and you know I guess I come from the same place because I can't wrap my mind around the idea of narrowing down whether you're talking about professionally or or just in terms of what you experience culturally on the side, recreationally, narrowing down to a point. It seems like others, and many others, 
do this very easy, almost by instinct. Is that what you observe? Uh, it, it amazes me, people's um, tendency to specialism, but perhaps it shouldn't amaze me because that's, of course, the way that our, uh, the whole educational process works. So the kind of, you know, just to, to talk about what I know about my own experience, you know, I did God knows how many O-levels, three A-levels, one degree, and then I jumped ship at that point before moving on to the supremely specialised pointlessness of a PhD, which, you know, I know if you're studying history or chemistry or whatever, there's a great deal of point in doing a PhD. There might even be a point in doing a PhD in English, but typically it seemed to involve finding someone, you know, coming across some writer who'd not been studied yet. Uh, why hadn't they been studied yet? Well, because they probably weren't worth studying. But it seems that you're always to be moving towards some, uh, you know, finer and finer point of specialism. Whereas I liked the, uh, you know, the you know, this was what Berger and Sontag really opened my eyes up to. Uh, just, uh, um, you know, of uh, somebody, for me, tr trained in literature, um, you know, one's interests broadening out into, in, into other areas. And I guess the, the thing is, this is quite well, a, you know, this is, I'm not saying anything original here, but sometimes the outsider, somebody not schooled in a particular discipline, can bring to uh, this uh, a new area of study all sorts of insights which um, just on the basis of familiarity were, were perhaps overlooked by people uh, you know who, who, um, who, who um, you know grew up in or uh, remained in the in the area that they that they studied having said all of that you know with say with photography where um, you know which I became interested in on the base you know, on the back of Berger and Sontag and now I've and when my book about photography came out, then I've been to a, to a degree sort of welcomed into the world of the of the photography expert, that world of uh, curators and photography scholars. And you know, I must say, it's been really, really nice. And also, uh, I've realised that they know, I mean, they know an enormous amount more about photography than I do. And I've really both, uh, I, I've sort of been parasitical upon, uh, on the work they've done. And God, I've really found it incredibly stimulating to be, uh, you know, to be invited to be part of these sort of dis ongoing discussions in, in, in that area. Now, when I see examples of cultural generalism, I guess I called it earlier, you know, when I include myself in this, I see an interest as strong in creators as in the things created. Do you, do you see that in yourself? I mean, are you as interested in Tarkovsky the man as you are in his films? Um, it it would depend on a case by case basis. So when I was writing about jazz people, they were incredibly interesting for all sorts of you know really quite easy reasons. You know they seemed to be a lot of them were wild eccentrics. They had extraordinary lives in the grips of you know massive historical processes, producing this music which seemed so mysterious to me. So they were yeah they were they were incredibly they were like mythological beings to me. At the same time, of course, they weren't, they weren't sort of superstars in the Mick Jagger sense. So to give a really, you know, to give a really mundane example of this, um, when I was writing that book, I, was, I went to see Charlie Hayden in the, in the Village Vanguard. And then I'm in the urinal and I'm, I'm peeing next to Charlie Hayden. Uh, so that weird proximity of, yes. of, of the mythic and the, and, the, and, the, and the ordinary. Okay, there's that. Then it really is on a sort of case-by-case -case study. I think, you know, everybody who met D.H. Lawrence for more than five minutes wrote some sort of memoir about him. Uh, because in many cases, this brief meeting with D.H. Lawrence would be the overwhelming experience of, of their life. Um, I suspect that although a lot of people really liked E.M. Forster and thought he was a nice man and they loved his books, I don't feel he generated that cult of personality in the way that Lawrence did. So it... It really, it really does. Uh, it really does. It, it depends on a, on a case by case basis, I think. And Tarkovsky, I would say, is a, as far as I can get. I, obviously, I never met him, but I feel quite. I don't feel any great. I don't. I'm not drawn to Tarkovsky as a as a as a, as a person. It's the it's it's the work. And I, actually, it's not even all of Tarkovsky's films. It's just. It's really for me. It's mirror. Mirror, Stalker, and to a lesser extent, Solaris. And then the creators you write about a lot, I mean, they, they often are ones, though, that 
whether or not they have what you could call a large following, they get talked about as if they were gods mm. often. And is it an impulse you feel to either ignore the god talk about them or to de-godify them in some sense? Not to say that they do, did bad work, but to, to bring them to the level of the urinal next to you, you know? <laughs> well, you see, I mean, if we come back to John Berger, who is, uh, uh, you know, who I first met in my mid-twenties, whose work I loved so much, and the... There's such a well this is such a well travelled route, you know, the young would be meets the, the writer or whatever artist that he admires and then this this person, you know, turns out to have feet of clay. And in Burger's case the stakes were so high because of the kind of moral uh, sort of quality, moral and political quality of his work. And then, you know, Berger turned out to be this unbelievably great, great man. And not just great because he was so clever and fantastically wise which you know I, that, that wasn't surprising but really to be just so you know if, there's so many things I could say about Berger and I would put the you know the the word est at the end of you know it's just the, the, one of the kindest most generous people like this so he just seemed uh, to me somebody who's so abolished that distinction that you get in um you know, in, well, it's that Yeats line, isn't it? Perfection of the man or the work. And, um, you know, I mean, he just... Uh, I mean, his human, his humanity, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and also, I mean, this was the key thing for me, actually, that, uh, you know, there's no humour in Berger's work. And mm. to find that there was this man I revered so much that you could actually have fun with him. Uh, and I think that probably came as a relief to, to him because... Um, you know, I think unless you're a real dick, you get tired of being revered very, very quickly, and you just want to have a good time with with people. Now, John Berger, you know, I, uh, having read accounts of people who, who knew him and, and all that, I don't think anybody describes him as a non-political type of person. And if anything divides people about his work, it's, it's not the lack of humor, it's mm. probably the political sensibility. Yeah. And you describe yourself in some of the essays here in the new book as being kind of a, a, a semi-formed Marxist youth, if I recall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you seem to... I, I would say nothing I've read recently from you has evidenced a strong political sensibility. I'll say it that way. Is that a quality you downplay or don't cultivate in in the sense of this sort of not dividing yourself from the rest of humanity? Because if anything divides, but besides religion, there you have it. Yeah. No, I would actually say in a rather sort of one-tone, um, guilty as charged. You know, it's, it's one of this strange thing. I'm quite surprised, really, that my writing has been so... has ended up being... that I've ended up being, in terms of sort of writing, such an apolitical person. And I... You know, I would... You know, I... Yeah, I don't, I, it's one, I'm not sure how it's happened, actually. But, I mean, I'll give you an example of this. I mean, I, last year I was at PalFest, the Pal uh, sort of the Palestinian Literature Festival, where me and a bunch of writers are, and we're seeing this, you know, this oppression, suffering, injustice, all this stuff. It's, you know, it's writ large. You'd have to be an idiot not to see it. And, you know, I could see all this stuff, as could all the other writers, and they were... Um, you know, they were writing stuff and, you know, and all the time we were there, I felt there was nothing for me as a writer. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm some totally heartless individual and I don't care what's going on. Maybe it's because I was within a group, in a group of writers and I didn't, I just felt I couldn't find any little thing there which was, which I could, uh, which was there for me. And that was, I, mean, it, I don't know, I mean... I wasn't even... I mean, I felt I should... You know, of course, there was that stuff that you... Because we were there to, as you know, in that classic way to, you know, to bear witness, to come back and tell people what we'd seen. But uh, I could do that to a degree. But there was... Yeah, just... I didn't... Just... There wasn't anything that I... I I've ended up writing nothing about that trip, even though it was... Uh, I mean, politically, humanly, emotionally, morally in every way it was one of the one of the big experiences of my life now I could on the other hand go on some completely pointless little trip to somewhere where there's no you know just 
point where there's of no geopolitical importance and, and end up writing something. And this is just one of the peculiarities of one's sensibility. You know, whereas on the other hand, for example, I know that John, when he went, when he was in uh, similar similar places, ended up, you know, of course, he, you know, ended up writing stuff. And I, you know, let, let's make this really clear. I'm not saying that in any. I'm not. I'm really not making some snooty Nabokovian point about. Uh, trying to claim that in some way my way of working is superior I mean on the contrary I really you know I, I'm I'm lamenting a, a, a sort of lack in, in myself here you know and nothing you know I mean the, uh, you know there's a you know when you know I mean you know for me Camus is an infinitely greater writer than Nabokov and it's probably because uh, of that capacity for political uh, in- engagement that he had whereas politically Nabokov seemed to me or, I mean, Im- imbecilic, really. <laughs> uh, l- let me compare it to this. You know, we're here in L.A., land of advertising. You know, many billboards, ma- just every kind of ad there is you'll see in L.A. And I see the advertisements. I see, you know, a big H&M billboard behind us or a, a seven-story vodka ad, and I will look at it and not feel bad about its presence, but feel bad that I don't feel bad. And with politics, often I will hear of an issue and feel bad that I don't feel bad about it. Is that... Is that a feeling you recognise at all in this in this sort of process you describe? Um, do you know? I don't. You see, it's. Um, you know, I wonder if my um, sort of a uh, my becoming increasingly apolitical in, in writing is itself a sort of political symptom because it's so. It seems to me so often there's stuff going on in our own lives and you think it's all you think it's down to you and it actually it turns out that you're just the product of uh, <laughs> you know of, of, of um, you know of uh, you know larger circumstances so of course you know so I'm born in 1958 and then leave university and it's the triumph of Thatcherism and then after all of that you know the after that period of opposition to Thatcher then we get you know labor re-elected but it's a labor which has taken on so many of the assum- core assumptions of deregulation, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. So it would have been quite odd in that... It would have been as odd to have been fiercely politically engaged in that period as it would have been to have been totally apolitical in the 1930s or or, or something like that. And then also I suppose there's this kind of... I mean, it's a thing about coming from England as well, I guess. I mean, a country which is so... You know, which one... We see going down the. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, we're in, uh, as you say, we're in LA, and Tim Roth, who lives here now, um, was asked if he missed England, and the assumption from this English interviewer was going to be he, he was going to say something nostalgic, and he said, "What that wreck of a country?" And I think there's a kind of quality of resignation, really, that it, that we have in England, which is so absolutely contrary to the American spirit. And I think maybe I'm sort of English to that extent, you know, this uh, just uh, just a sort of, yeah, just sort of resigned, really, um, um, to to two things. This is... God, it's again, we come back to Berger. You know, what? A, I mean, one of the great things about Berger, his absolute... He doesn't have any capacity for resignation at all, and that's what's kept him young, of course, this sort of fighting, fighting spirit. Um... And sorry, I don't know quite where we. I don't, I don't know how, how we've got there, but uh, yeah. Um, oh, it was about billboards. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Wasn't necessarily actually, about billboards. I like, I like the billboards here. Of course. I have no problem. Yeah. You know, I, I want to move to a subject you can get heatedly engaged in to finish this off, which is well, we mentioned off mic before. This is the LA Times Book Festival. We we know you have a an ongoing ping-pong match with Pico Iyer <laughs> post-panel. What are the standings there, and what are the stakes? OK, well, uh, it's quite interesting, you see, because uh, uh, Pico's mysterious life, he, he apparently plays, uh, you know, he lives in Japan, spends all his time playing ping-pong with these Japan, ageing Japanese masters of ping-pong. We've only actually played once, and it was... Um, it was really unsatisfactory. We were playing at the, uh, at the Standard, the hotel... Yes, around here and it was it was kind of great in a way in that it was like um, you know Pico and I were about the same age so there we were it was like being in a photo shoot for some hip hop album with <laughs> these two, yeah, two like middle aged guys and it's all just these gorgeous sort of bikini clad young, young, young girls and there's Pico and I playing ping pong but 
Um, that was great, but it was really windy, so you can't play ping pong in, in any conditions at all. And then, perversely, you see, Pico claims to be this global soul and all this kind of stuff, global nomad, but, um, you know, he never comes to England. <laughs> <laughs> and if he did come to England, we could sort this out once and for all, because uh, where we live now, we've actually got a ping pong table, and uh, there's no wind there at all. It wouldn't be, there wouldn't be, there would be none of this kind of bikini distraction. It would just be Pico and I going at it on the ping pong table. Controlled environment. Yeah, exactly. You know, two men enter, one man leave. Cast we could the sort the, yeah. Um, yes. But in fact, we only ever seem to play, we so said we're going to play ping pong here in, in LA again, probably tomorrow, probably at the standard again. And uh, I just feel it's, you know, in like when, um, there are certain uh, sort of athletics meetings where any any uh, anything you achieve isn't subject to sort of independent ratification. So it's really just not a proper. Uh, it's not a. It's not a. It's not a ping pong approved thing. But uh, um, yeah, I feel we could have some great. It's funny. I always seem to end up on a panel with Pico as well, or just these. Uh, you know, the, I sometimes think the um, the panel title. You know, there's always they always come up with a title, but uh, they should have a title like. Oh, these two. Oh, let's, 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 let's drop these two in and see what they've got to say. <laughs> and, of course, listeners, when I interview Pico Iyer himself in June, I will follow up on the results <laughs> of this match and see, you know, where the, where the leaderboard is at that point. I've been speaking with Jeff Dyer, author of many books about many things, but a coming one on Tarkovsky and the current one, otherwise known as The Human Condition, selected essays and reviews. Jeff, thanks so much for taking the time today. Uh, thank you, Colin. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for taking the time as well for, for reading all these books. It's been fun. <laughs> This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. If you want to hear this interview again, visit colinmarshallradio.com or visit the iTunes store. Search for the Marketplace of Ideas. In either place, you'll find the complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive, always completely free. And if you want to keep up on new, current, upcoming, all kinds of Marketplace of Ideas interviews, as well as related internet interestingness, sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Get that information delivered to your email inbox weekly. Details are at the Marketplace of Ideas ideas website colinmarshallradio.com very simple stuff all right there on the front marketplace of ideas page our theme music is produced as always by ben althaus find his website at benalthaus.com questions comments feedback of whatever kind especially guest suggestions always welcome send that along to colin c-o-l-i-n at colinmarshallradio.com that is colin at colinmarshallradio.com thanks as always for listening and Hope to catch you next time on another Marketplace of Ideas for more cultural conversation of the depth you demand.